What's up, do you know? Hello? Hello? 
We're on, Eba. We can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Greetings to all of you who have joined us so far. Uh, and welcome to old friends like Tor Selstrom, who I see there. Uh, Christian Manzanise, Reward Mushabasa, David Moore, Toko Mache, and of course our panelists. Uh, uh, we have Tandekile Moyo. I should begin by saying, can you see they not able to join us? Uh, but we have Tandekile Moyo, a writer, social activist, a geographer by profession, uh, but she has done a master's in intergenerational impact of Kukurawundi, and she'll be speaking to that. Then we have Kit Silika, a researcher in the UK with an interesting career. The was in, formerly in the ZRP for three years. We, we worked in the in the protection unit. He was telling me, looked after, among others, men used to. Jonathan Moyo, parents Shiri, before leaving and going to the UK, first as a policeman, but now he's PhD in forensic archaeology, uh, specializing in the identification of victims of Gurahundi. Um, and last but not least, uh, before that, I think Luke Tamborenyoka was a journalist, who will be speaking more on the current manifestations of ethnicity in, in politics in Zimbabwe. And then Denizuru Jethro Mpofu, a political philosopher. He'll be looking at the liberation politics and decoloniality. He's also a member of the GGA, uh, which is a partner with Surface Trust uh, currently. Uh, so that's our panel. I will now introduce the, the topic. And I'll ask uh, Tony and Mikhail to assist in posting the slides to which I'll speak to. Uh, I just want to say as we get the ready, that this is a very important question, Zimbabwe's national question. It pervades the entire history, I would say the, the, the recent or contemporary history of Zimbabwe. Uh, and uh, we are grateful to to Tendekile Moyo, who through two pieces in the Daily Maverick provoked us into a discussion. We seek to look at the, the question broadly beyond just Gukurahundi, as important as Gukurahundi is a landmark, as an, as an illustration of the failure of the post colonial state in resolving the national question. But the problem is big. And, 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 and characterizes the current situation in Zimbabwe. So that's, uh, that's our title there. Uh, the Zimbabwe's national question, the root causes of ethnic strife in the social state period, including its manifestations in the post-2017 coup and how to begin addressing the problem. Uh, next thing, uh, defining the national question. This, the national question re refers uh, brought you to the relative success or failure to resolve the question in the context of establishing a nation state and nationhood itself. And in the African context, we speak more of the nation state in the making as an, as, as an unfinished business uh, with varying levels of success. Uh, we cite Tanzania, for example, and Zambia uh, in subsequent remarks uh, in the region. Uh, but clearly the Zimbabwean situation is one in which the nation state in the making is still in, in rough waters. And to illustrate the national question, we, we cite some historical precedents in the post-bourgeois nation state era, the post-Westphalian post -Westphalian state, to which Dinizuru Jethro Mpofu will speak uh, shortly. Uh, but good examples of the bourgeois states uh, born out of the demise of feudalism and the emergence of capitalism 
uh, and the bourgeoisie as anchor class of the na nation state, where the European based uh, states like the UK, uh, Germany itself, although it has gone through turbulent times since the Westphalian state, uh, France, <clears throat> and of course, uh, the European based dominions. Uh, moving too fast, can you go back, please? The European based dominions based on conquest and extermination of the native people in the Americas in Australasia post 1492, which is celebrated as Columbus Day uh, with much uh, fanfare in, in the Americas. But as Samir Amin often pointed out, that's the beginning of the nightmare for the rest of the world, now known as the developing or third world. And of course, the Southern and South American states must, must uh, remind us that these are not indigenous states. These are states based on conquest by the Spanish Portuguese in the, in the 15th, 16th century. Then of course, we have the modern dominions, the USA itself, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. The pertinent point here to make is that these states, especially the USA, uh, born out of conflict and even a civil war, born out of the conquest of native peoples and the importation of African slaves across the Atlantic, uh, became a united federation on the back of an anchor class, the national bourgeoisie, uh, which, which defines the broad parameters of what you can call the nation state. Likewise in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And by comparison, the failed dominions are the Union of South Africa. Remember the Union of South Africa was born in 1910 on the back of the conquest of the African people. And as, as, as a peace treaty between the Boers and the Brits after the Anglo-Boer War. Um, again, it, it is these, like the USA, is a consensus among the, the national bourgeoisie uh, that there's more to gain out of union than of separation. And the other failed dominion was the Federation of Region and Yasla. Let's remember that the, the white settlers in southern Rhodesia refused to become a fifth state of South Africa uh, in 1923 and pursued the idea of a, another African Union in competition or in parallel to South Africa, the Union of South Africa. This was the ill-fated Federation of Region Yasnet, which was formed in 1953 and saw its demise in 1963 with the independence of Malawi and Zambia. But again, it was a, de a determined attempt to form a dominion which would have included part of the DRC, Katanga. Um, just a reminder. Next one, please. There, one can also com uh, compare the success in virtual commerce of the USA and the Western uh, national bourgeoisie or bourgeois states with the demise of the USSR in 1990-91 or Yugoslavia. Um, and one might say, well, the idea always has been that as with bourgeois states, the national bourgeoisie is the anchor class, the center, which holds things together. Uh, the USSR at, uh, experiment or attempt, the Soviet Union, was an attempt to have the socialist uh, state as a center, or socialism as the, the foundation of the USSR. Then we have the post-colonial states, the products of decolonization. A friend of mine, uh, Richard Mashave, 
uh, in a debate last week uh, said, well, we can speak of, of decolonization uh, in Africa, including Zimbabwe, but less of independence and liberation. I think that's a very pertinent point. But the but basically, uh, the product of decolonization means that there are states which are established, recognized by the UN, by the AU. They have a flag, an anthem, etc. And then, lastly, this section, Pan-Africanism, which is the broad, maybe is both an expression of of a mission. Uh, based on a common history of the African peoples at home and the diaspora uh, of having a united Africa you know, uh, currently uh, expressed as it is through the AU and the, the African Economic Treaty of the Abuja Treaty, as we call it, uh, which, by which Africa was supposed to become an economic in the political unit by 2026, we're very far from achieving that. But it does, in a broad sense, explain or even express also the failure of the nation state in Africa. And that for many analysts, the idea is perhaps we should strive for a bigger whole, such as the Pan African Union of Africa and its diaspora, then pursue what appears to be a wasted effort in creating nation states which have failed so far, especially under the comrade of bourgeoisie that has taken over control of most of these states. Um, yes, so I don't know if you're aware that there is a 57th, the AU has just approved as 57th state of the AU, the, the, the diaspora state, the African diaspora state. Uh, I, just, I just discovered that this week. And again, it seems to be evolving and developing on the back of uh, a, a bourgeoisie in the diaspora, <laughs> uh, including one called a King David based in Dubai. Interesting and fascinating. Let's move now to defining Zimbabwe itself. Uh, the post-colonial idea of Zimbabwe uh, really is, like in most of African countries, is usually defined on the basis of previous empires, uh, sometimes romantically, uh, with, with the little or real foundation. But in the case of Zimbabwe, we have uh, historians on the pre-colonial Zimbabwe have done some fantastic work and I've been a, an average student of uh, pre-colonial Zimbabwe and reading the works of people like Gerald Mazarire, uh, for example, uh, this chapter in that book by Rev Topless and, and, and uh, Mulambo, the Becoming Zimbabwe. And so for the earliest that we have a record of is the Kalanga Empire of 400 BC with Madame Mombe, where Blaue is today as its capital. And this Kalanga Empire, uh, more or less uh, 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 conflates with the Rosary Empire later on in 1690 to 1830 as I showed there below. But there are two points I want to make here. The first is that the what we call the Zimbabwean population, we are largely descendant of the Kalanga. And the, the, how the Kalanga became Karanga might be largely a reflection of the political economy of pre-colonial Zimbabwe as, as, as societies moved from hunting and gathering to agriculture and therefore moving eastwards to what became Great Zimbabwe, uh, 1290 to no, 1450. And then the related empires at the, well, the same time, the Torwa well, the Torwa empires, 1450 to 1690. And then the celebrated empire, the Mutapa or Mutapa empire with, uh, with Chikafa 
uh, on the Zambezi Valley as its capital, which stretched, I would say, from 1490 to the 18th century, it stretched from Baira in the east to Sorowe in modern Botswana. It was a massive empire, and in many respects, it also included parts of Zambia. And like the Great Zimbabwe, it was also the unbounded, as we know the Zimbabwe to be. So, for example, the Kalanga Empire of 400 BC uh, was on the well, on, on on the on included parts of Botswana, parts of South Africa, and of course Zimbabwe. Like the Great Zimbabwe was related to the Mapungubwe, what is called uh, the Mpopo province today. So we, we have to, in looking at the pre-colonial uh, period, we have to put aside the idea of boundaries. And even rivers in the pre-colonial period, rivers were not boundaries between people. They were facilitators of integration between peoples, as they are all over the world. And then we have the Rosary Empire, um, or the Moyo dynasty. Uh, which uh, really uh, uh, was 1690 to 1830. But it is generally believed that the Roger Empire reflected the beginnings of an integrated Zimbabwe, modern Zimbabwe in every sense. Uh, and even the Ndebele state, 1897, did not overtake the Rosie Empire. If, uh, in my view, in my narrative, the Ndebele state, the arrival of the Ndebele state, reflects one of the amazing uh, uh, experiences in African integration. Because the, the, the Ndebele, they could not have survived without a level of the integration in the population in the empire, the Rosary Empire, in which it became part. Yes, it, uh, there was uh, Ndebele hegemony, the Ndebele state was hegemonic and culturally so to this day. And that's why we find the, the very loose reference to Ndebele as meaning anybody and everybody who's Ndebele speaking and anybody and everybody who's in the Western part of that kind of the country. Uh, but I think if so, then it reflects really more the levels of positive integration than those of conflict, as highlighted by people who, are, who want to highlight uh, the negative elements in, in inter-African relations. Fine, we'll move on. Now, the root causes of ethnic conflict in Zimbabwe. The first, the colonial enterprise, the making of tribe and tribalism. There is a beautiful, those are students of uh, sociology and the political economy. You do well to read that famous article by Achi Mafeje, The Ideology of Tribalism. It's very, it's seven pages, makes it very clear. The concept of tribe and tribalism are a creation of European colonialism and or anthropology and sociology, because the word tribe refers to, uh, sociologically to a pre-colonial social formation, unhindered, uninterrupted by, modern, by modernity. And in reality, there is no such a social formation left anywhere in Africa certainly not in Zimbabwe, nor in Southern Africa. Um, the making of Mashonaland, land, Matabil and Manika land, uh, these terms uh, and nomenclature are not only deceptive in describing the country, but are dangerously emotive in promoting precisely tribalism and ethnic, uh, ethnicity as we know it. And, and, and the, the, the stricture of the post-colonial state is the extent to which there has been no attempt to date 
uh, to reconfigure Zimbabwe, as happened in, my, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Tanzania or Zambia, where the, the average Zambian today does not remember Barotsi land, which is now Western Zambia. That's the extent to which other post-colonial dispensations try to deal with this issue of the archaeology or the architecture of the architecture of colonial, the colonial enterprise. And uh, in that uh, making of Mashonri, Matabilan, Manikaran, and so on, are also the roots of the Midlands factor in its apologies. The Midlands factor, maybe it's a subject for another day, but I hope that uh, my, uh, my panelists will deal with that, but it refers broadly to the extent to which the Midlands factor historically reflects the, the level of integration caused and the hegemony of the Ndebele state as long as it lasted from 1830 to 1897. And these people tend to be uh, almost you know, politically schizophrenic in their conduct, but also they tend to be, at least from the ZANU experience, they tend to be rapidly anti ndebere rapidly, as, uh, I think they, they almost want to show that they have no relationship at all with the Ndebele uh, factor of which they are part. And in the, in the highly tribal atmosphere, of guerrilla politics or in, in ZANU, the worst, among the worst uh, expressions of uh, eth ethnic, ethnic uh, expressions, uh, tribalism has come from the Midlands factor. And today as Luke, I uh, hope he does join us, we'll be discussing these current manifestations in particular the emergence of what we call the Mberengwa, factor in small bodies. Then there was a formation of tribal associations after the conquest of the, uh, the, the uprisings of 1896-1897. Tribal associations were formed and defined around these assumed tribal identities constructed. And the role of a Christian missionaries in the ethnization of Zimbabwe cannot be forgotten. Um, and if you look at the history, those who have done the history of Christianity in Zimbabwe, you will see the country was parceled out. The Dutch Reformed Church, the around Mashingo, Morgenstern Mission, the, 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 the Jesuits uh, around the Shawasha Mission, um, the Shawasha people, or what they call the Zuzuru people. And you also had the, uh, the, uh, the the Lutheran missionaries in parts of the Midlands, uh, uh, parceling out, so to speak. But what's significant here is the making of Shona. The word Shona emerges for the first time in 1930 at a conference held at Shawasha Mission, which brought together missionaries to form a, 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 a a language for teaching purposes, for written written writing purposes in schools, because it was called Shona. It's still a, a, a subject of, of uh, speculation as to what Shona meant, uh, apart from the well-known uh, pejorative meanings attached to it. But certainly that's where Shona came in 1930, through Professor Doak. The, so the, the Shona dictionary, uh, was, uh, was really, a, or the word Shona itself was a compromise between the, the dialects, mainly of the Karanga dialect around Morganista mission and the Zuru dialect around Shawasha mission. And all the other dialects such as Ndao, Manika, uh, Kalanga, Venda were subsumed under this term Shona. And do not forget in the, in the colonial enterprise, in the making of, of tribe and tribalism, don't forget the chief native commissioner uh, who took over. The chief native commissioner took over from the Mambos. If you remember after the 1897, in the particular, my 
my great grandfather Mangwende was in fact deposed as Mambo in 18, 12th of September, 1897. And his position was taken over by Chief Native Commissioner Will, uh, Will, Will, William Edwards in 1897. And the Chief Native Commissioner took over in areas where the uprisings were most intense, uh, 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 so-called Mashon East, which was really the Mangwene dynasty, the Masha Mombe in the Chegutu, Kadome area, uh, Makoni area, Chingaira was, was uh, executed. And the chief native commissioners therefore became the expression of the new colonial administration. Next, please. Then the other root cause of the ethnic conflict, ironically, the African nationalist enterprise itself. The nationalist Petit Bourgeois class coalition, which was a coalition of those tribal associations that to the reference which I've made uh, under the colonial era. And the idea was that uh, the Petit Bourgeois, the middle class would come together and and subsume ethnic identification or presumed identities under one nationalism. You get a, a good dose of that uh, in uh, Dominic Stoller's book, African Nationalism. But we are, uh, but Gerard Mazari and myself are looking on a, working on a, on a, on a work on uh, working on uh, the history of nationalism in Zimbabwe, and we we are following this very carefully. Um, and the term Zimbabwe itself uh, is said to have been first coined by uh, George Nandoro, others say Mike, Mike Mawema. But basically, as, as in Zambia or Malawi, African nationalists always looked at the past, the romantic past, and it couldn't be a better symbol for that than the great Zimbabwe itself. So, one would say it's as good as any, it could have been the rosary, it could have been anything, but that explains the origins of Zimbabwe. And the Nationalist Coalition didn't last long. Uh, if you took 1955, the, the ANC Youth League, George and Nandora and George Kerema, up to NDP in 1959, and ZAPU 1960, and 1963, Zapu split, uh, breakaway Zanu, and thereafter, the, there's a lot of work being done on that uh, the Zapu Zanu split, and certainly uh, one of the factors was the Cold War. Uh, that Zapu uh, leaned more and more towards the Soviet Union as as the struggle evolved. Um, and also as part of the authentic six, along with MPLA, uh, uh, Felimo, uh, Swapo, ANC, um, and these were more or less in the, uh, people would say in the satellite of the Soviet Union, where ZANU was subsequently seen to be more in the, with China, but uh, documents show close the close uh, the role of the U.S., especially the U.S. Embassy in Dar es Salaam, uh, and the and even the Israeli factor in Tanzania at the time in the formation of ZANU, and even the initial funding of ZANU in the in the, in the 60s uh, in Dar es Salaam, and then of course we have the struggles in the struggle and the reference to my. Tejara Masipula stories work on this, which is really an account. In, in, in many respects, I would like to say that ethnic politics was manufactured in exile. I grew up in the era of the struggle, a national struggle at home. Uh, we, even at my age, at, at, at 23, 24, I was shocked to find the level of ethnic consciousness in exile, which was not present at home. It became highly toxic 
in the struggle era in Lusaka, in Maputo, in Dar es Salaam. And you saw the intense ethnic conflict in Zab itself, though not so violent as it was in Zab, in Zanu, but it, is, it was a process uh, within which Zab, which was a national, a truly national uh, a party, with the, the Murewa, one might say, high fields in the urban areas being the more or less the center of Zapu, even in my home area, Chiwata, uh, Chiweshe, these were very strong Zapu areas. Uh, gradually became in exile, increasingly identified or conflated with, uh, with ethnic uh, uh, backgrounds such as Ndebele or Kalanga. Uh, and eventually gave the breakaway of people who maintained the national identity of Zapu, even in exile, Shikarema and Nando, breaking away and forming Frolizi, which became as a Zulu expression. Vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis, uh, Zapu, which had become largely Ndebele speaking, Ndebele Balanga. Um, and ZANU, which after 1975 and the decimation of the Manika factor in 1975 and the death of Chitepo, the killing of Chitepo, became identified with the Karanga factor. Not to mention the removal of the story in 1975-76 as the decision of ZANU. Anyway, we have also the conflict which has settled or settled and talked about. Uh, the uh, party ethnic conflict in the guerrilla armies, the Mgagawa massacre of 1976, where the the, the Zanla factor more or less overcome overcame the uh, the Zipra factor, and conversely the Morogoro massacre, in which the the Zipra were more dominant over the the Zanla factor. Okay, next page, please. So, um, the, the, yeah, I'm looking at the efforts at uh, uniting these uh, ZANU and ZAPU and the armies, Zipra and ZANU, the various efforts which did not succeed. Uh, I mentioned the Cold War. The Cold War really is more in the context, not of Zipra, but more in the context of the, the, the uh, sustenance of the division between Zapu and Zanu, and which made the patriotic front more expedient than a real unity that it ought to be, and which collapsed soon, ironically, soon after the Langest House Agreement, which, which uh, heralded the uh, uh, independence a few months later. Yeah, the last page now. The post independence era, the nation state in the making, question mark. As I just made reference to the breakdown of the patriotic front, which is rather dramatic for some of us, with even those of us who were at Lancaster, we were surprised when we got back here during the ceasefire to find that we are now back to ZANU and ZAPU. Uh, weeks before elections, uh, 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 all I can say at this stage, it was really. Uh, a reflection of the enduring conflict and division between Zapu and Zanu, a more expressed more in terms of the leaderships of these movements, uh, personality conflicts, perhaps more, but which were translated into very tragic um, and 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 and. Uh, in uh, episodes in our history which cannot be forgotten. Uh, we can begin with in, in Tumbani in 1981, in Tumbani 1 and Tumbani 2, which saw our soldiers murdering one another. I was unfortunate to be in, in Bulawayo for both in Tumbani and 2 on government business. And I remember in Tumbani 1 helping to 
count the bodies that were had to be put in uh, wagons. Very sad indeed. Then, of course, the biggest factor <coughs> that period, Ukura uh, Undi, uh, which really tore apart the country, even as 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 things appear to be normal. I remember in my case, uh, we had uh, Minister of Manpower Planning, which was made up of both uh, uh, Zapu and Zanu, uh, in terms of personnel. Suddenly we found that my numerators for the National Manpower Survey uh, in, in the areas of the western part of the country, in the Midlands, suddenly disappeared, or were said to be detained or even killed, until the whole Gukuraundi became very public, and subsequently the so-called uh, Unity Accord of 18, uh, 1987, which for us historians was less a Unity Accord than the conquest of Zapu. And I remember speaking to the old man, Joshua Nkomo, and he explained that he, he simply conceded to the Unity Accord to stop the killing, the killings in the Western part of the country. He said those words himself, and you can find that in his book, uh, his autobiography. But then, which is the point I want to make to Tandekile, that it's it's less a tribe against a tribe. If you if one wants to talk about the Gugraundi thing or similar violence that the state has meted out against its people. The, the role of the state, state-sponsored violence against its people. I will, I will argue that the, the, the post-colonial state in Zimbabwe is a vicious factor when it comes to, the, to, to having to, to impose conformity, when it comes to punishing those who don't want to conform, um, as shown during election violence, uh, and election violence in, in, in 2008, for example, was terrible in, in, in even in, in Zanu, Zanu strongholds like Mashon and Central. Uh, people were, 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 were shot, killed, maimed for not voting for Zanu PF. Um, in the runoff of 2008, was largely the, the Zimbabwean state, the military, against the strongholds, Zanu strongholds, in the, in the so-called Mashon provinces. You should remember that. And so that book by, by um, uh, Lloyd Sachikonye, when a state turns on its people, is a very poignant one. And I remember when Sujia Demira wrote an editorial under the title, When a State Turns on Its People, which caused me a lot of problems with Robert Mugabe. Uh, when we were criticizing Muramba China, when the urban population was ravaged in 2005 for not supporting ZANU PF for going with MDC. So, last in this section, the coup and its aftermath. And I hope that Luke has joined us since to explain the extent to which the, the last three years. I saw an expression of ethnic uh, uh, politics that one could, could not imagine, almost unimaginable in, in, the, in the 21st century, but you will see the extent to which the, the Zimbabwean state become ethnicized uh, in the various institutions uh, around ethnicity, not just the Karanga factor, but even the Berengwa Karanga factor, as Luke explains. So I leave that to him. And before I now conclude, next, last page, please. There's a text missing there. way forward. I'm proposing that we 
restoration of constitutionalism, including the full implementation of the 2013 constitution, a truth and reconciliation commission, including an account of killings and atrocities during the colonial and struggle eras. The, the, the killings in Zambia in 1975, the killings uh, in Tennyson conflicts among ourselves should be looked at because these, unless these are addressed and confronted, will never have a peaceful Zimbabwe. Um, but most of all, we are recommending a deconstruction of the colonial heritage by reconfiguring Zimbabwe using the compass as happened in Tanzania and Zambia during Nyerere and Kaunda eras respectively. And there we, we throw a map. Uh, there's one missing there, uh, central, north, west, east, south, and central. And whether this coincides in some form with the existing doesn't matter, but I think we should recast and in, institute an educational program uh, in our schools and uh, tertiary institutions towards becoming Zimbabwe, towards a national, a truly nation, nationhood in which everyone feels they belong to the country. I'll stop there and uh, invite uh, Tandekile to take off from me or to contradict me as you wish, Tandekile. Thank you, Ibo. Uh, and yes, I am going to contradict you on yes. some of the aspects of your presentation. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for that history. I think it's really important when we're talking about these things to speak about them in context and to understand um, what brought us here. So um, without wasting too much time, I'm going to get into uh, my part of the discussion. And uh, I want to say that if we're to be honest, many of us here have witnessed uh, tensions between Ndebeles and Shonas in various aspects of our lives. And I, I'm saying this in cognizance of the fact that when we say Shonas, uh, there's no such group as Shona's. It's a, a group of different ethnicities. Just as much as you explained, Ipo, right now, that the Ndebele state was not just a group of Ndebeles, but it was different ethnicities that grouped together. So uh, please bear with me. I'm going to be using the terms Ndebeles a lot and the terms Shona's a lot because my study is in the context of Kukurahundi. And thanks to Kukurahundi, all the people from Matebeleland who were non Shona became at the time Ndebeles and the target was Ndebeles. So um, that said, I'm going to go back to what I was saying about all of us having at, at best just witnessed tensions between these two groupings and at worst having perpetrated some of these tensions or spread stereotypes about Ndebeles are these or Shonas are that, you know? So that is the nature of our country. We are divided and we're divided along ethnic lines in so many ways. And um, the thing is a lot of people just uh, hear these stereotypes and uh, they just go with them without realizing just how deep this issue of ethnic tension goes and where it stems from, you know? So like, I, I, I'm an example because I, I really knew nothing about these tensions growing up. You know, growing up, I was so blind to our different ethnicities. I had Shona friends, Tonga friends, Kalanga friends, you know? And uh, I really did not know anything about any history that could uh, differentiate us and differentiate us to the point of uh, hatred between different ethnicities. But with age, I started uh, opening my eyes to a lot of things that seem trivial. But as you look at them in the bigger context, you ask yourself, wait a minute. Like for example, I would get into every government office in Gwanda where I was born and bred. And for me to get service in 
the majority of those offices out have to be able to speak. It started to feel like oppression because I did not have a choice. I didn't have a choice. It wasn't, I am a very fluent Shona speaker. I'm a very fluent Debele speaker. I can speak a bit of Kalanga, but when you get to a situation where you are forced in a country that has 16 official languages to only have one official languages as the language of business, as the language of the, 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 the social language, then you start feeling some kind of oppression. And this is something that is difficult to understand if you have never felt it, if you have never experienced it. So it's these small things that you experience bit by bit until you start to feel also some type of resentment towards it, you know? So this was my um, first experience of uh, the tensions between our different ethnicities. But my first real experience of hostility towards me because I am from Matibeleland was in university. I got a place at the Midland States University by force, basically, because uh, my application was rejected, but there were so many other people who had uh, lower points than me that, that got in. And you know, I remember uh, my, I was quite an independent 18 year old, I think, because I went to MSU by myself after I'd been rejected. My father wrote a letter to Professor Zopo and uh, asked for an explanation as to why I didn't get a place. And Professor Zopo was really cordial about it. He just wrote me a letter to go and give to the chairperson. I don't remember what was in the letter and I got a place. But from that day, the chairperson of the department hated me. The first question he asked me was, are there no universities in Matabeleland? It seemed like an innocent question to me as an innocent 18 year old, you know? And uh, I, I'm sure I just answered, I, I don't remember what I, I could have said, but my four years at university were hell because that man never forgot, first of all, that he had denied me a place and then been forced to give me a place every turn he would remind me that I'm from Matibeleland. He would make me feel that I did not belong. And it raised a lot of questions in my head. Why, why would someone be so hostile towards a student because of where they come from? And I remember there's a time I failed to hand in an assignment in time because uh, my son was in hospital. When I told him, he, he, he failed me and said, he heard that I'm always following Boso around the country. And you know, it was so ridiculous to me because first of all, I'm not a soccer fan, but the association that you are from Matebeleland, you, you support Highlanders is something that seems innocent, but there's a lot of stereotype that is deeply entrenched in, in those feelings and those sentiments that are expressed and they are hate, you know? So I'm going to move to this point of hate and to say, it is an undisputable fact that ZANU-PF hates people from Matibeleland and that ZANU-PF perpetrated hate crimes against the people of Matibeleland. If we def hate crimes are defined, I'm going to read this out because I don't want to make a mistake. So hate crimes are defined as criminal offense against a person or property motivated in whole or in part. I want you guys to hold on to this in part part because it's very important. So uh, these are crimes against a person or property motivated in whole or in part by an offender's bias against a race, religion, ethnicity, and so many other things. So Kukurahuni was a hate crime. It was murder and destruction of property and an effort to eliminate an ethnicity. The reason why this prejudice or this hate happened whether it was politically motivated or it was motivated by whatever is besides the point when it comes to defining it as a hate crime. ZANU-PF perpetrated hate crimes against the people of Matebeleland and they perpetrated these hate crimes on ethnic lines. And this could have been as explained by Ibo because 
ZANU PF hates anybody that votes against them. And so you need to understand that hate crimes do not mean that if somebody hates people of Matebelele and, and perpetrates crimes against them based on ethnicity, it doesn't mean they cannot hate Ndawus because of ethnicity. It doesn't mean that they cannot hate Muslims because of religion. The hate, it, it's, the hate is not mutually exclusive. A person full of hate can hate different groups of people, but we need to accept that what happened in Matebeleland was hate crimes. And this is from a victim's perspective. I know there are many different perspectives. There are perspectives from political analysts, there are perspectives from academics in different fields, but we cannot argue about the fact that Kukurahundi was a hate crime. And because of the scale, it was a genocide. It was motivated by hate against the people of Matebeleland because they voted against ZANU and MAS in 1980. And it was a genocide because the only people that were targeted by the state and the soldiers sent by the state and by the ZANU PF militia and by ZANU PF citizens, civilians based in Matebeleland were non Shona speaking citizens in Matebeleland. So, this is important for us to say uncomfortable as it may be, because there is no way we can solve this without accepting that there is a problem and this problem is ethnical and it has resulted in ethnic tensions that are now spiraling out of control because when you ignore a problem for too long, extremism comes into play, you know? So what happened? was an extremist crime against a people. And that has gone ignored for so many years. And because it has been ignored, we are in danger of revenge crimes coming into place. You know, I, I'm a fan of art as a way of explaining things. And because of that, I read a lot of books and watch a lot of movies. I, I think there's a movie called A Time to Kill. It's an American movie and it's about, a black man whose nine-year-old daughter, very young, I may be wrong on the age, but, but this man's daughter was raped by two white men. And, and when, the, when she was now explaining to her father, she was saying, I called you, daddy, I called you, and, and you didn't help me. And the helplessness that this man felt upon hearing that her nine-year-old, his nine-year-old daughter had been so violated because of hate, that a hate crime had been perpetrated against his daughter. It, it was too much for him to the point that he just picked up a gun and gunned down those two people that perpetrated the crime. So unfortunately, because this man was trying to meet justice towards the, the people, the two men that raped his child. But by doing so, he committed a crime and justice had to be meted against him as well. So my point is that hate crimes beget hate and it becomes a cycle. You know, it becomes a cycle of hate that is difficult to quell the longer the crimes go uh, uh, un, un, unfixed or the longer we go without talking about these crimes, telling the truth about them. And that is what is happening in Matebeleland now. We've got uh, many groups of people who are now saying, look, Sorry, the host muted me for a moment. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, I don't remember now where I was, <laughs> but uh, I think I was now, okay, I was talking about cycles of violence, how if we do not go out of our way to fix these injustices that happened in the past, we're in danger of having repeat cycles of violence. And we see that now because there are many voices in Matebeleland that are now saying, okay, so ZANU-PF killed our parents or ZANU-PF killed our children and nothing was done to fix that. 
what is the point of us remaining part of this country that does not acknowledge the crimes that were perpetrated against us? What is the point of staying as part of Zimbabwe? Of what benefit is it to a Zimbabwean from Matebeleland to stay part of a Zimbabwe that perpetrated, uh, whose government perpetrated a genocide against Matebeleland's people and got away with it? Not only did they do that, marginalization against the people of Matebeleland continues. And the institutionalized tribalism is something that we face every single day. So someone from Matebeleland will ask themselves, what is the point really of staying part of this country? Why not secede? And you know, I hear people talking about secession being extremist and it, it shocks me that people will see extremism in feelings of wanting independence, but see no extremism in the perpetration of a genocide against an entire, uh, not even one province, but against several provinces in our country. You ignore that extremism, but you see extremism in parties like MRP, who are now saying there is no hope for people of Matebeleland in this country. So why don't we just cut ties? Why don't we just break up? What is extremist about a breakup? What is extremist about a breakup from an abuser? Because what we need to understand is that Zimbabwe is under ZANU PF government. And if we talk about cessation, we are talking about seceding from ZANU PF rule. So I really struggle to understand why people feel that this, this topic of secession is a no-go area, it's treasonous. How is it treasonous? If we are in agreement that ZANU-PF is a hateful government that has uh, perpetrated crimes against all of us, why then when some of the victims of, of the violence say, they no longer want to be part of this country. You think it's extremism. What is so extremist about saying, I'm done with this abuse. I don't want to be part of it anymore. And remember, as Ipo explained, some of these um, borders are, are results of colonial uh, rule, you know? It is because of colonization that Zimbabwe is Zimbabwe as it is now. So if we really want to go back that far in history, we will find more arguments for secession than against secession. And I want to make it clear that uh, I personally do not believe that secession is the way to go, but I'm against the criminalization of secession as an option for people who feel that it is an option for them. Victims of abuse are, have got every right to decide for themselves how they want justice. They have every right to decide for themselves what justice means to them. And if they are victims who believe that justice for them is seceding from Zimbabwe, nobody should criminalize that. Instead, people should come to the table, have a conversation, and we decide what is the best way forward without criminalizing any of these, these sentiments that victims hold. Right now, we've got the MRP9 let's, being- let's sum up, uh, sum up, sum up, uh, Okay, sorry. So right now we've got the MRP that's being persecuted and they're not getting any support because they preach cessation. And I find it really uh, hypocritical because we cannot persecute each other because our, our, our way forward is different. Anyway, uh, the bottom line is that we need to talk about what happened in Matebeleland. We don't have to bury our heads in the sand and say it was not an ethnic, uh, it was not, it, it, what happened was not ethnic because it was according to the victims who as in my article I explained were either killed or saved because they were non-Shona speakers. So we need to 
talk about these things. We need to come together if we are indeed one country with a vision for peace and reconciliation. There can never be peace if there is no justice and there can never be reconciliation if there is no peace among us. But how do we achieve that peace? We achieve it by acknowledging the crimes that were committed against some groups in our country, by acknowledging the gravity with, in as much as yes, bad things have happened to everyone in our country, but we need to acknowledge that a genocide is at another level altogether. Anyway, I think uh, the other things I'll say as we discuss, but thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tendikile. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions. Uh, some are coming up already. Is it uh, justice or cessation? Other than saying, what is the basis of cessation? Uh, who are these people uh, talking about cessation? Others are saying, are you conflating the ZANU PF with, uh, with, with, with everybody? Um, and is uh, the state the same as the generality of the population? These are questions which are coming up. But I think okay. um, we move straight to Keith. Keith Silica. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for Dr. Mandaza for inviting me to this interesting uh, discussion. Thank you, Tandikile, for your, for your discussion previously. And uh, there are things that I agree with you and the things that I'll disagree with you. I'm going to start off with uh, my personal journey in terms of uh, Gukura Wundi. And, um, and I'm also going to discuss uh, the, Shona, uh, the Shona question and semantics of our identity. And I'm going to finish up with uh, possible options that can reduce uh, ethnic strife between them. Um, different groups that uh, broadly described as Shona and Endemen. My own personal journey in terms of studying Gukurundi and searching and even knowing about Gukurundi started at Morris Depot when I was housed with another Ndebele um, constable called Constable Lunga. So we were housed together because my surname is Silica and his surname was Lunga. So the instructors thought we were both from Matebele and I was not from Matebele. And they'll be called the, the, one of the senior instructors will constantly give us very difficult tasks. And I, I never understood because I was quite young then, I was only 20. And I said, Lunga, why is this instructor doing that to me? And he said to me, because my Debel is not that good. He said, Umuyama Fifth Brigade. I was like, Umuyama is one of the Fifth Brigade guys. I was like, oh, I don't know anything about, I did not know anything about CCJP. I did not know anything about what happened in Matebel. And it was only when I moved to, England and I started researching and uh, getting my eyes my eyes open with uh, in, in terms of Gukura Undi. So that's that I wanted to make that introduction to to make to to make people aware about the complexities of using Shona and Debele in general and also so my surname is Silica it's got an L and there's no L in Shona and when I've when I've been researching Gukura Undi sometimes people will be saying like oh you're, you're going to start conflict you're one of the Debele and when I'm with Shona people I get a different kind of response. So there is kind of uh, attrition as Tandikile, um, Tandikile mentioned. I'm also gonna agree with Tandikile on several issues that she, she has raised in terms of the marginalization of people from a table in, in, in political context, in, in, in terms of uh, economic context, uh, you know, the, the, we all know that Matebele is very under well de developed. And uh, we all know that there is, um, in terms of Gukura only, there's been lack of acknowledgement by, by the state. There's been memori memorialization of, uh, of, of Gukura Undi has been, um, has been banned. You know, there's no birth certificate and death certificate for, for surviving victims. So there's this gener intergenerational continuation of what happened in, in, in Gukura Undi because people are still suffering loss as a, as a result of that, you know, one of the ridiculous things we come across this is the recruitment of non shorter speakers to teach in Debele speaking schools. That is a cause, cause of strife as well, because I, I disagree that how can people from um, uh, other parts go and teach in places in which they don't have the lot, the capacities, particularly in, in teaching um, those uh, um, particular um, uh, languages. So the, those, those, those areas are broadly, agree with with particularly what she said it's quite that, that that's quite apparent 
Um, however, the old, the old actually issues that I, I disagree slightly is characterization of an individual being Shona, and also we need when it comes to Gukuraundi, we need to define our our perpetrators, which was ZANU PF. We know that there was ZANU PF. It was a ZANU PF idea, which started in, right after independence. We know the army that caused it. We know there were the Central Intelligence Organization was involved in those issues, and we know some of, uh, members of different army groups were involved in Gukuraundi, and also the makeup of those organizations was mixed. They were, they were white people, they were Ndebele people, they were called Shona people. All of these people were, were, were responsible for Gukurawundi. So that, all those uh, issues kind of muddled the, the, the general characterization of, 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 the, of the perpetrator. So I prefer using, as you mentioned previously, uh, defining the, 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 the perpetrator as, as ZANU-PF. And not, ZANU-PF did not start this a uh, Gukurawundi strategy. It, it did not end the Gukurawundi strategy after, after 1987. They continued to decimate opposition because of uh, Mugabe's desire for, your, for, your, for, for a one-party state. Um, it's very important in that context, if I can quote uh, uh, the, one of Africa's most famous writers, Chimanda Ngozi Adichie, Adichie. When she said, show people as one thing over and over again and become, they become themselves, you know. So, so there's dangers in, 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 in labeling the perpetrators uh, constantly, constantly as, as Shona and Shona. And also I can quote, uh, there's a famous good book, which I'll post on the chat called The Mods and the Walkers, uh, Folk Devils and Moral Pan Panics. It, it describes uh, how people <laughs> construct uh, identities and culture and make it a thing and those and those individuals become that thing based not only on what has happened or based on what people feel that is so so it's, it's quite important and I know you mentioned the uh, the book uh, when you when you mentioned the, the ideology of, of tribalism I've not read that but I've got a guess that it probably describes some of the the, the, the similar elements uh, in regards to um, uh, the, the construct of, 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 of tribes within Zimbabwe, ETC, ETC. Um, and also I, I would like to touch on briefly on, um, on ancient uh, de uh, Greek democracy uh, idea that in terms of um, us approaching the attrition and strife between various ethnic groups, the, the Greek demarcated three individuals within society. They say they were, they were idiots, they are idiots within society, they are tribalist society, and they are citizens within society. Idiots are the self-centered people. Probably I could say, I could say plainly, some of the, the ones that I found is in, in, in Zanapu have all been responsible for all these atrocities that we that we see presently. And then there's the, the, the tribalist. There's nothing wrong in an individual belonging to a certain tribe and being proud of that tribe. What might be problematic is an individual having tribalistic, probably monothelic views those individuals, are, it's very difficult for them to be a, um, a, a positive contributor to society. The last, um, the last kind of citizens that the Greek wanted are they called the citizens. People are open-minded and people are willing to do work be, uh, and, and, and acknowledge um, ethnic dif differences, cultural differences in, in, in various individuals in order to, to move uh, um, uh, the, the, problem, the problem forward. Um, I'm gonna, um, I think my time might be running, I'm not sure. So I'm gonna end in terms of what can we do about ethnic, uh, ethnic strife uh, we, we, we in Zimbabwe within the context of, of Gukuraundi. Um, we all know that the, the, the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission that's been um, uh, going on for the past couple of years is nothing but a front, um, a, a delaying tactics for, for us individuals who want uh, truth telling and other transitional uh, justice processes come through. So the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission is not going to move uh, the issue of, of Gukuraundi forward because they've demonstrated that, you know, we want an open uh, transitional justice process where victims, where, where it's victim centered and it's open. In terms of victims, I want to touch that briefly that Zimbabwe has over 10 Gukuraundi victim groups all wanting the same thing. And they're all perpetrating the same issues in terms of ethnicity and tribe, etc. Et 
that is slowing us down. I was fortunate enough to, to have a meeting with the International Commission of the Missing Persons Director uh, in The Hague when I was uh, presenting them uh, my thesis. They were asking, like, what are the victims like? I say, they are, they are, we've got loads, we've got tons of victim groups. So that's quite problematic when an organization such as the ICMP would want to work with, uh, with, the, with the Zimbabwean groups in order to advance and, and resolve um, issues sur sur surrounding Gukraundi. So in terms of the NRPRC, we need, uh, we need a, a new thinking. You know, Gukraundi, I know Zimbabwe has so many organizations already in terms of transitional justice, but I think Gukraundi needs to be housed on its own with, with, with commissions and our directors and a structure which contains various people from history, archives, um, forensics, um, and media, ET, ETC, ETC. So that is the direction that, that, that might work forward. Because I was fortunate enough to work in Ireland you know, for, for a similar commission uh, on, 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 on the forensic context. Again, victim groups, despite in Ireland victim groups being uh, slightly divided, it's almost in Zimbabwe, they came together you know, they were victim focused. They came together to search and um, and identify their their missing successfully, despite uh, their own differences between the nationalists and the, and the, and the republicans. They did manage to come together. And also, there are so the other low hanging fruits that um, us citizens of Zimbabwe can uh, can can contribute towards the. Uh, uh, Gukuraunde in in terms of uh, political advocacy, advocacy in terms of legislation, in, and and people like me and my background in terms of forensics. For example, we don't have we have a MDC role of honor victim groups. We don't have that for 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 as far as I'm aware for victims of Gukuraunde, and we have free software from the ICMP which is readily available for us to utilize because we need a list of all those uh, individuals that, that were killed in Matabele so that we can have accountability. So these are the things that we can do on our own. Also, we can also draft our own bills and legislation, but that also depend on, on the political climate that will prove uh, what to parliament we have, uh, know, how, how many people we have in there so that we can pass certain bills because all the things, all the issues around Gukuraundi and uh, political violence and all the strife that's happened in Zimbabwe has happened somewhere else and what has worked in, in such in places in, in uh, as a government as a, in, here in England and also in South America, there were dictatorship that exploited um, uh, divisions within their population. But when those victims and individuals came together, those dictatorships fell. And some of them, as some of you are aware, even then uh, people are still looking for the Nazi Nazis, you know, 80s, 80, and uh, 70, 80 years down the line. So we can also do the same. You know, we need to you know, come together and uh, probably be careful with our language in terms of labeling uh, individuals in a certain way. You know, I've got like very, very good professors from various different backgrounds who wanted to study Gukraundi, study Gukraundi sometime, and they're very, very, um, they're not comfortable in terms of those labeling. And some of them have been labeled Gukraundi people when they have been trying to write books about it, that kind of thing. So that is my uh, small contribution towards uh, what, what's the problem in terms of the attrition within, within the country and also what, how can we resolve it? So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Keith. Thanks very much indeed. Just want to do, just to try and moderate the discussion. Two things, one, we want to speak about victims of, of, of violence, victims of state atrocities, uh, without a hierarchy of suggesting that some victims are more important than others. It's one. The second, more important, is that yeah. the second, more important, is that we need to make such atrocities or genocide as as Gukurandi not an ethnic issue but a national issue. The, it must be dealt with in the national context it is an, it, it is it is a and as, as long as we particularize it and and put it in in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a separate category we run the danger as much as as the status so to do that in the manner in which it perpetrated that violence in the, in the Gugurundi years we should not fall victim 
with the citizens to take your term, uh, uh, Keith. We, the citizens, should not fall victim to that. We need to uh, address problems such as these in a national context. I'll ask uh, 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 Denis Zulu, Pietro Mpofu, to help us in putting everything together before we turn this to discussion. Before we talk. Oh, thank you very much, Mwalimu, uh, uh, Professor Iqbo Mendoza, for this platform and the many colleagues that are participating here and others that are connected in this um, virtual space where we are trying to navigate and, neg and negotiate ourselves in understanding these uh, troubling issues before us. Uh, my principal argument, which is also my capital observation and also conclusion is that um, uh, what we have in Zimbabwe in terms of um, a government in the present, um, an administration of the, what is supposed to be the nation state is actually a native colonialist regime that took over from the secular colonialist regime of uh, Ian Smith in 1980. And my presentation will seek to flesh out that observation, argument, and conclusion with ethnic strife in perspective. Uh, I seek to argue that in the same manner in which uh, secular colonialists weaponized racial classification, racial discrimination, um, of the people in order to perpetuate colonial dominance, dominance of the polities and the economies. The ZANU-PF regime uh, in Zimbabwe has weaponized ethnicity in the same manner. There's a way in which secular colonialism managed to graduate some of its uh, modes and tools of rule right into the movement that was supposed to be fighting it. And what came in 1980 was um, a native colonialist regime that is so far through Kukurawundi and other festivals of cruelty and violence demonstrated all things colonial in terms of rule. They call it Ugutonga and the country itself has been collapsed and compressed to an object called uh, Chinu Chetu, our thing, and all that. So uh, all that language actually brings it to life. Um, what has happened historically where what was supposed to be a nation state in a country has been collapsed into a native colony of a kind. Right, um, in its genealogy and birth, uh, the nation state itself has got um, many understandings that have been circulated about it. But I want to privilege um, the events of 1492 in southern Spain uh, with the conquest of Granada, uh, parts of Al Andalus and Andalusia which were the remaining city-states in the West that were not under Christians and Europeans, that were under the Moors, the Muslims, and some Jews. So in 1492, actually in January, when uh, Granada was conquered, uh, the nation, that had conquered the Christian nation had to have a state. And the state that took over Granada from King Mohammed had to have a nation. That is, people were to be one under one flag, one religion, um, uniform aspirations, 
one national anthem if you wish. And that nationhood was not persuaded. It was not legally built. It was not built out of consensus, but out of conquest. Jews were forced to convert from Judaism to Christianity. Muslims were forced to convert from Islam to Christianity. Those that resisted were crucified and destroyed. So there was forced conversion of some by the conquerors. And some people, especially women, that had knowledge, that had power, and that were doing certain important jobs, were bent at the stakes as witches. So the women that participated in politics, in medicine, in healing, and everything were pronounced as witches and described as people that were beyond salvation, that could not be civilized, and they were bent at the stakes as witches and sorcerers that the nation state could not live with. I'm going on, on and on on this um, conquest of um, Granada because that is the event where the template of colonial conquests and imperial invasions that took uh, place in the entire global side, South Asia, Latin America, and Africa were based on. So the way Africa, Asia, and um, the Americas were conquered, the template of that particular kind of conquest, the conversions, invasions of territories, uh, massacres, ethnic cleansing, and everything were generated, demonstrated, and dramatized first in Granada. So that template of colonial conquest was carried over to the entire global south that included us in our corner and that dark armpit of the world that we found ourselves in called um, Zimbabwe. Um, after that, um, we we'll realized that within um, Europe itself, there were wars, conflicts, most of which were actually religious, national, ethnic, economic, political, and otherwise. Like uh, the Thirty Years' War that ended with the peace of West Falia in 1648. What was the achievement of West Falia 1648? It was the modernization, democratization, and civilization of the nation states in Europe. Uh, Westphalia was an agreement that let's recognize each other's differences as Europeans and whites. Let's respect each other's nationalities, uh, borders, sovereignties, and humanhood, and live together in tolerance, in peace, and in civilized competition for resources and for power. Tragically, and much unfortunately, that Westphalian epiphany, that Westphalian discovery, and the importance of the common family mood of human beings was not extended to the global south. It was retained as a gift and as a resource of white people, of Europeans, and those that called themselves civilized, uh, the masters of the universe and the conquerors of the earth. So in the global south, the forms of conquest and colonization and so-called civilization that took place remained based on ethnic cleansing, forced conversions, uh, massacres, and biblical violence where people were killed in large numbers and killed using inhuman uh, modes of mass murder and other forms of colonial evil that we continue to witness. So the happenings of 1884, 1885 in Berlin were happenings that were an extension of that politics of conquest, where a continent was sliced up like bread, resources carved 
for the consumption, control, and domination by selected uh, European powers that took charge of different provinces of the um, continent. Nationalities and ethnicities of the uh, continent were severed, cut across, divided, moved, scattered, squeezed out, and um, dispossessed and displaced as did way. And all that was part of um, colonization in its amplification and multiplication in imperialism. And then one would expect that when liberation movements came in the 50s, in terms of rhetorics and talks in the 60s and they intensified in the 50s when countries like um, Ghana became independent, arrived up to our own time, that um, those that were appointed, who appointed themselves liberation fighters, will find it important to decolonize the nation states and these colonial modes of rule and these colonial modes of governance and these colonial modes of conquest and domination of one by the other based on identity politics. But what happened, in spite of many calls by people like Kwame Nkrumah, George Padmore and others that we should have one United States of Africa that will be ruled uh, using the ideology of Pan-Africanism uh, and all that, toxic African nationalism prevailed that there should be nation states that govern themselves, that enjoy certain sovereignties and that pay tribute to Pan-Africanism only through or multilateral organizations like the, the Organization of African Union then, what we have now as the AU, what we have now as SATIC and all that. But toxic African nationalism managed to triumph over the spirit of Pan-Africanism and unity amongst the people of Africa. And genocides, massacres, and other festivals of violence and cruelty became possible in Rwanda 1994, in Zimbabwe 1982 to, to date, because Kukura Wundi is, um, was talking about it is an ongoing genocide and epistemicide, not a thing of the past. The question is, how is it proceeding? How is it happening? We can talk about that. Right, um, tragically, if one looks at such a liber so-called liberation strike, like the war against secular colonialism in Zimbabwe, uh, if we consult statistics now, many black Rhodesians then died of struggles within the struggle than uh, those that were killed by secular colonialists. There was more killings of black people by black people than there were killings of Rhodesians um, against black people. And Kukurawundi itself dropped more bodies, more graves than were dropped by the secular colonialist uh, regime of E.N. Smith. So the structures within the structure that uh, Masipula Stolle fleshed out and other historians and scholars have fleshed out were much deeper and much troubling than we normally take them to have been. So my argument there, um, or Professor Mandaza, is that the liberation structure itself got colonized to an extent where it collapsed from a structure of liberation to a structure of conquest and dominance of the post-colony by a native elite. Well, for us that are interested in research, you can consult Professor Peter A.K. of Nigeria on um, colonialism as a social system, where he describes how the elite in the so-called liberation structures and the elite in the so-called um, secular regimes became uh, forces and entities that needed each other. And they were all pitted against 
the masses of the people of Africa. So what we had in 1980 was a native elite taking over from a, a colonial elite. And what was delivered was native colonialism. Kukura Undi has large scale murder as a genocide with economic, political, social, and cultural ramifications and spiritual effects was a, a telling symptom of um, native colonialism, where some natives had taken over from Sekias and had become colonialists and were prepared to cleanse uh, the Zimbabwean soil of those that were now called pollutants, impurities, the chaff, the name of, of Kukura Undi, uh, translating Kukura Undi to English means chaff that must be flushed out of the land, that must be cleaned and washed away. That's what was happening. It was a manifestation of native colonialism at its biblical extent. Professor Mamhut um, uh, Mamdani uh, narrates how the Tutsi genocide of 1994 itself was also uh, a, a, a development of native colonialism where Hutus uh, using the Hutu power ideology identified themselves as the natives of Rwanda and had a duty to God and a duty to the motherland and the fatherland to cleanse um, the land of Tutsi impurities and pollutants. People can ignore this uh, or neglect this in their research, observation and um, expression, but there are so many books uh, published by Zimbabweans, right from Morris uh, uh, Lawrence Bambes and ill fated people and other texts that clearly portrayed uh, and developed people as seculars that ran away from Chaka and uh, came to, to what they describe as Zimbabwe and these people are foreigners should go back where they came from or behave as foreigners and be content with the crumbs of the national cake that fall onto their, on the ground for them to kick and not demand more because they are not authentic natives. Those discourses are there and they worked in the politics during this, the Bush war against secular colonialism and that. And there were some in Zanupia that felt that they were the prophets of the land, defenders of the motherland and the fatherland that had to deal with the, the Debele question in Zimbabwe after dealing with the Rhodesians and all that. Those are facts, unfortunately, as they are of history that cannot be ignored as drivers that drove um, to go ground. Um, and I did say that I, right inside the, the liberation struggle, uh, native colonialism and nativism as an ideology was born. And this nativism was to explode into a genocide um, after uh, Rhodesian secular colonialism did a legal and political retreat, even if it didn't do a, an economic withdrawal, right? And Franz Fanon has given to us on the table a description of how African nationalism degenerated from nationalism as it is supposed to be a unifying ideology to nationalism as a divisive ideology, where we moved to chauvinism, ultra racism, racism, and other toxic ideologies that divided the people. And we ended up with the same colonialism that we were fighting, only that now that colonialism was now being driven and brought to life by some natives. So tribalism became political capital that was usable. For Mugabe to reduce Ngomo from Father Zimbabwe to father of the dissidents, to a tribal chieftain, and to some non entity there by the corner, the ideology of tribalism that my first uh, talks about had to be propelled. It had to be injected into the people of Zimbabwe and made a passion. The people of Mashona Land in the main were educated into tribalism, which they didn't know, were fueled and impassioned with tribalism. A very great book written recently by uh, Professor Miles Tendi reveals tellingly 
and um, using some of the most the, the finest uh, uh, social science that actually the first political party to have dissidents was Zanda. More than 3,000 Zanda cutters were commandeered uh, by Rex Nongo and the hierarchy of the leadership there, not to report to the assembly points, to prepare to campaign for Zan PF and to monitor the villagers in Mashona land who were supporting Zapu, who were preparing not to vote Zan. So there was Zanda dissident activity in Zimbabwe in 1980 and afterwards. And that history is not properly fleshed out. What is magnified and amplified is how Zipra and Zapu had dissident bandits and all that. And that history might be um, a subject and a topic for another day. Right. Um, Franz Fanon, one could think he was talking about um, Zimbabwe when he described how natives can actually degenerate into colonials. If one listens to the language that was being used by Nkomo, or, or that was being used by um, uh, Mugabe, Ino Sinkala, uh, and um, the Kadas in um, ZANU PF talking about the people of Matebeleland, about Zapu, about Joshua Nkomo, that was colonial language. People were called things. People were named in derogatory and hateful uh, terms that um, Tandegili was um, describing before us right now. Mwalimu uh, Professor Mandaza, I want to argue that Zimbabwe has not even attempted to be a nation state. Um, it, there, there has not been even an experiment or a pretense at it. But what possibly it attempted to become was a state nation where a certain political party colonized state institutions, state systems and structures. And the state became the party and the party became the state. There was that completion. And that state nation made no attempt to build the nation. The attempt that was made was to build the party, <laughs> to build the regime. I'm afraid yeah. you can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, it told me that the host, the host had muted me. I think it's ZANU PF using witchcraft to silence me now. <laughs> Thank you, Mwalimu. I'm back. Um, where was I? That a part has colonized the state, conflated it with itself. And what you have is a state nation at best. And at West, it's a party nation. Masipula Stole and uh, John Makumbe talk about um, the one party psychology that possessed Robert Mkabe and Zanu PF in, in the 70s and in 1980 going forward. That was a, a colonial psychology in my observation and view. And that is in place. What we have in Zimbabwe is a state that is a party and a party that is a state. And some authentic, Original ZANU PF members will tell you that what you have now is not ZANU PF, but a faction of ZANU PF that is calling itself ZANU PF and is sort of, in their own view, migrated from um, the original plan or the original plan. So you might as well be talking about a factional state run around a family and a father in the same way in which Mugabe had become ZANU PF and ZANU PF Mugabe, to the extent that Chris Mugabe could say anyone that opposed Mugabe opposed the nation and opposed the state. It's the same thing that is happening now. One only needs to read uh, Professor Jonathan Moyos' uh, Excel Get, a book that every serious Zimbabwean should read, by the way. And one only needs also to read that report by the citizen Maverick to show how the Mnangakwa family and its friends, not just the faction that is in power now, have literally colonized the economy and the polity. And that actually going to elections in Zimbabwe right now as an opposition political party is a waste of time because the army, the police, the intelligence, the judiciary, and other structures of state power 
uh, ZANU PF and forbid any prospects of political change. With the economy, every sector mining, farming, manufacturing, right up to Omalaicha that carry goods from Hillbro to Cholocho to Pulawayo and to Arare. Now that the president, his family and friends want to have trucks that carry goods for people, they want to ban Omalaicha, ban uh, cross-border taxes. That's how deep the colonization of the economy and the polity has been by the present native colonialist regime. Right. Um, the monopol that monopolization of life, economic and political and social, by a small but powerful minority that is backed by the army, the intelligence, the police, describes native um, colonialism. So right from there, uh, you can see a clear picture of what is happening to us and what is happening to Zimbabwe. Right, uh, briefly about Kukura Undi, I think Tandegele did justice uh, to that specific uh, subsection of what we're talking about today. Just like what happened in Grananda, in uh, Al Andalus and uh, Andalusia, Kukura Undi was a, a, a war of conquest, like what Mualimu Mandaza said uh, just now, where a certain people had to be politically neutralized had to be converted from one political ideology to another, and they have to be forced to renounce a certain history and uh, accept uh, another history. Just listen to the language of uh, Mugabe, Emerson Nangakwa, and Ino Singala during Kukura Undi. It was the quasi-religious language of people being converted, people repenting, and people becoming something else that they were not. And in that war, tribal passions were fanned tribal fires were ignited and the hatred was propelled and that divided the nation almost beyond repair to the extent that when Tandegele argues that doesn't secession make sense, you then see the rationale, you then see the, the understanding. And then you see the reasons um, uh, why there are some authentic people that believe that they are nationless, they are stateless in reality. To the extent that one can say that, why do you blame MRP for talking secession when the ZANU PF government has long forced uh, non ZANU PF people and some non Shona people to secede politically, spiritually, and culturally from the mainstream economy and mainstream polity of the country? The people that can be accused of secession of tribal divisions are clearly the people that are governing the party state or the state nation that we call Zimbabwe today, using the ideology of nativism that brings to life the native colonialism that I'm talking about. So what are we going through in Zimbabwe in closing? We are going through an elongated um, interregnum that um, uh, Antonio uh, Gramsci saw forcefully strive. That when the old is not dying and the new is not getting born fast enough, you have an interregnum where morbid symptoms appear. Kukura Undi was a morbid symptom of um, colonialism, native colonialism. Um, Rambatsina was a morbid symptom of native colonialism. The recent shootings of uh, an armed protesting voters in 2018, Kukura Undi itself, and the monopolization of the economy and the polity, the butchering of women, just like it happened in Granada, treating them as witches and wolves. Just look at how Grace Mugabe herself was treated when she showed political aspirations. George Mujuru, Tokozani Kupe, the words which who uh, sorcerer are brought into the fore, just like it happened uh, in, in Granada. Uh, Professor uh, Horace Campbell has written a powerful book on the patriarchal uh, liberation mode uh, in Zimbabwe, in that book titled Reclaiming Zimbabwe. That's where we are in an elongated uh, interregnum where colonial symptoms, colonial modes of rule, and native colonialists are in charge, where 
leaders rule as conquerors, not as liberators. And they do threaten this every time. Do this, and then you will see Chinu Chineve Nevacho Ichi, Chinu Chetu, Kutongwa Waro, and all those discourses that are actually symptomatic and expressive of native colonialism. Uh, Professor Mwalim Mandaza, can I pack it here so that I enable the conversation to proceed and uh, we see join together? See Thank see you see so much. Okay. See you Gave you all the thing you're, you're, you're driving it, so we couldn't stop you. We're driving it. I think it uh, forms the base of discussion now. We invite discussions. I think James uh, uh, has brought in a new concept which I've read. Uh, uh, from him before, native colonialism, nativism, as an ideology, state nation, party nation, factional state, all important. It, was, it has helped us to de-emphasize the, the ethnic basis of uh, state violence and highlights the nature of these predatory violent states that we have. Uh, but I don't want to go too far uh, and, and, and preempt the discussion. I invite uh, comments, put up your hand, and uh, uh, Dandekile and uh, uh, Keith come in as you wish. Uh, uh, Tony Rila, you want to say something? Yes, thank you, everybody, for a an extremely rich and difficult and problematic discussion. Uh, my reading so far in the discussion is that I think we're in no doubt that ethnicity is a problem and ethnicity is used uh, as a tool for the maintenance of power. What does concern me though is history. Uh, German once commented that a nation that doesn't understand its history will never be a nation. And I think the discussion today amplified that. But I want to make some very specific points. Uh, and in particularly in the relationship to uh, who has the right to challenge for the ills that they were done. And and I've seen comments on, on the table that uh, what happened in Matabele land between 72, between 82 and 87 requires special treatment. Now, I, I want to challenge this right now. Uh, the violations that happened in Zimbabwe, I think, could be characterized uh, from pre-independence to now as a series of crimes against humanity. There's no doubt in my mind that were the right legal apparatus to be there, that what happened during the liberation and conducted mostly, and I, I disagree with, uh, uh, with Jethro, uh, that the Rhodesian government committed crimes against humanity. There's no doubt in the definition. That's followed quite clearly in my mind, whether you call it crimes against humanity or genocide, uh, between 82 and 87 is again within the category of that. We could fit what happened in the elections in 2002 and 2008 quite clearly within uh, the definition of crimes against humanity. Uh, Operation Murambuchena, that has been described by a UN Special Rapporteur and endorsed by others as a crime against humanity. Uh, 2008, and indisputably a crime against humanity. And the Human Rights NGO Forum has pointed out that the violations that have taken place subsequent to the coup, the coup could also be described as crimes against humanity. So the question I'm asking is, are some victims' uh, situations more important than others? And is that not a product of ethnicity? Because the way forward, is that the victims of the organized violence and torture that has taken place for nearly 50 years, uh, do any of them have a greater right than anyone else 
if you were smacked and tortured in a keep in 1973 in Dotito, is that worse than what happened at Balagui? Is that worse than what happened to people in Mashonaland Central in 2002? Is that worse than what happened to someone else? I dispute that. So if you start from the perspective of the victims, then all the victims have common cause. So if you're going forward and you want to challenge the youth of ethnicity, it seems to me the victim's perspective is really critical. We're all in the same boat. It doesn't matter what happened to us as being distinctly different from one another. What matters to us, that it happened to us. And somebody is responsible for that. And that is the state. And one of the important points that Ibo made right at the beginning is that's how the state has functioned for, I don't know, 140 years in Zimbabwe, is to use this tool of divide and rule and back it up by organized violence and torture and leave us divided. So when we have these conversations now about some victims are more important than other, I think that's a continuation and in buying into the same story. Thank you very much. Very powerful, Tony. Very powerful. I hope okay, uh, we're, we're, taking, we're taking note. That's, that's the whole point of raising this discussion to a, a higher level than particularization and, uh, and, 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 and really as much as uh, the individual is important, I think we need to keep it as general, as, as, as uh, clear as possible. And, 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 and veer towards even, even Jethro's uh, uh, proposition was really on the role and conduct of the states, state sponsored violence. Uh, let's have uh, Melusi Nkomo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mandaza, for bringing uh, a broad spectrum of perspective. Some um, bit populist, some some radical, and 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 and, and some very critical. Um, so, take my contribution as either uh, a question or a general comment. Uh, the first one um, pertains to 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 the idea of of, of um, the dialectics between uh, collective uh, narratives and what happens in actuality. So in this sense, I'm, I am of the idea, I might concur much more with, uh, with Silica, yeah, that ethnic violence tend to, to take its ethnicity ex post facto after the first, after the fact, after the narratives have already come up. That's when people are then labeled that it's the Ndebeles who did this or it's the Shonas who, who, do, who do that. So if we agree, as you have said, Dr. Mandaza, and, and, uh, and what uh, Denise Ulu, uh, pointed out, that tribalism was constructed as a, as a technology of governance during colonialism, how then does it become a primordial fact? in the post-colonial state. So we are contradicting ourselves in there. So if it was constructed ethnicity and tribalism during the colonial times, and if we agree that our post-colonial um, uh, state in inherited a lot from the colonial government, so it is the same tools, the same technologies of governance that are perpetuating themselves, which means that in Zimbabwe at the moment, the idea of ethnicity and tribalism is also being constructed by the present state. So we shouldn't contradict ourselves in, in that sense. So, okay, it was constructed during colonialism, then all of a sudden in post-independent Zimbabwe, it becomes a, a primordial fact that there are static categories of the Shonas, static categories of, of, of Ndebeles. That is my comment number one. Then a short, a short one to add to that. Mm. There's, there's also the idea of oh wait, also a dialectic between the, the, what we call the state and those they dominate, which explains why there is always renewal within the Zimbabwean state or, or, 
or within ZANU PF itself. And mind you, my point is not vindicating the brutality that happens in Zimbabwe. I'm just suggesting that the state in Zimbabwe feeds also on the people that it dominates, which explains why they, in as much as we don't want to acknowledge it now, there is a renewal in the leadership within ZANU PF from the ranks of the people who were formerly uh, uh, dominated. Just as an example, a lot of artisanal mining, miners, so-called Makorokoza, are finding themselves moving up the echelons of power in Zimbabwe. Take, for example, the Minister of, of State Security and a lot of others coming from the Midlands province. So there's always this dialectic. Let's not take the state as something that is mono, um, monolithic, static, and not moving. There is a dialectic and even complicit of the dominated Zimbabwean people, which explains the long, long effort of ZANU-PF and, uh, and, and the continued brutality uh, that is perpetrated on, our, on its citizens a lot of times without accountability. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. I'll take Tawanda Mtasa and then the brilliant Mflana. Thank welcome, you very much, Ibo. Yeah, welcome. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I, I also appreciate uh, all the inputs from the um, various commentators. I think uh, they, are, they are immensely helpful uh, for a very important conversation. Uh, so briefly, I wanted just to come in on a, a couple of points. I think firstly, uh, it distresses me actually that um, uh, Tandekile even had to put in that energy in trying to make the point that this was a genocide. The, such a given that um, uh, generally that's a point that actually sh sh should not be emphasized. I think it is clear in terms of international law uh, that what happened uh, in uh, Matabele and Midlands provinces uh, the 1982-1987 period uh, is a genocide. Uh, and that is not unimportant because these uh, labels under law attract certain consequences. So the same way that we have had cases, for instance, uh, like uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, versus Serbia and Montenegro at the International Court of Justice, as an example, uh, it is possible in the same way that you can have a state that can take Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is a party to the Genocide Convention from 1991, from 13 May 1991. Zimbabwe is a party to the Genocide Convention. Uh, if a state that is a party to the Genocide Convention uh, takes Zimbabwe to the International Court of Justice under Article 9 uh, of uh, the, the ICJ uh, of, of the Genocide Convention and actually say Zimbabwe uh, has not uh, performed its obligations to its people in terms of the, 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 the crime of genocide. So it's not an important, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you are, emphasizing, you are emphasizing that. It's a pity, like I said, that it has to be emphasized. But secondly and separately, I think uh, the fact that what happened uh, in Matabele and Midlands is indisputably a genocide, I think should not make us uh, get confused about the perpetrators. Uh, so in my view, I think Sipo uh, has made the point, and I think it's a, it's a very legitimate point in the commentary that, uh, and I think uh, uh, Tanikile also emphasized the same point that the narrative of victims is critical. So when victims say, uh, this was what was done to us on this account, we should listen. However, in the same breath, let's also not forget the role of leadership. And the role of leadership is in the same way that we see those videos where Tongo Gara is saying during the liberation struggle, we are not fighting whites, we are fighting a white system. The role of leaders, those of us who participate in these meetings, those of us who have the privilege to go through the learning that we go through to go through the reflection that we go through, to go through the discussions that we go through. The role of leadership is also to explain to victims that no, it wasn't Shona people. It was ZANU-PF 
perpetrating violence, uh, uh, perpetuating a particular ideology, which was cast and based within the context of uh, how it sought Shona hegemony, but it wasn't Shona people. And that distinction is not unimportant. So I think, I think that's part of what I heard Kate also emphasizing uh, when, when he was saying it's important, I think, for us to uh, build that unity of uh, victims, as it were, so that it becomes a national question. It's not an ethnic or tribal or provincial uh, question to be relegated to those that are uh, concerned about uh, what is happening um, uh, in a particular province. Uh, it, it, it is a collective issue for, for the nation, for, for all of us. Indeed, perhaps for humanity. That's why I was saying we can even lift it to the level that it must be, uh, which is that it is a crime under international law, uh, which humanity as it were is concerned about. Uh, and then the third and last point I wanted to make is, I think I uh, having said that it's also critical and I agree with um, the point that Tony uh, was emphasizing. I think you also say that yourself uh, at the beginning, Ibo, that let's also look at um, the a vast panoply of our tortured history as a people and the various incidents and episodes that we have had of crimes against humanity, of genocide and so on. That should not mean that we conflate everything. We should uh, attend to everything in its seriousness, uh, in its specificity, but let's not commit for victims. You finished, I wonder? I wonder. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder. Yeah. Yeah, Unfortunately, I think he is uh, disconnected. Oh, uh, Fuji, yes, yes, he was talking important yeah. stuff. Um, brilliant. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ibo. Um, I, I want to begin by saluting all the uh, presenters. I enjoyed your presentations. Uh, Keith, it's been a while. We should catch, we should catch up. Um, uh, there are a few things that I wanted to comment about, um, which I have always at some point discussed uh, with, uh, with Keith and some colleagues, Denis Zulu in particular. Let me begin by first uh, saying, uh, one of our colleagues here just talked about uh, the construction of ethnicity, and then Tony Rila also talked about uh, uh, ethnicity being a problem. Let me let me let me make it very clear here. Uh, my argument has always been, as an academic, that uh, ethnicity is not a problem. Ethnicity, like uh, all the, uh, this is I'm saying this because I refuse to accept that uh, the view that ethnicity. Uh, is merely just constructed and it's primordial. I argue that ethnicity is, is innate, it's, it's part of us. We are born into it. And uh, that said, I also want to uh, foreground my argument by saying one of the things that we see if you look at Europe is that Europe is what it is because the states that we call European states are actually ethnic best. And the, that is, ethnicity has never been a problem there dating back to even the Westphalia or even before the Westphalia, if you look at the Thucydides and other, and other periods, ethnicity has never been a problem. But well, when we look at Africa, ethnicity has been presented in the post-colonial state in Africa as, as a problem. Why is that so? It's because during the liberation struggles, or well, I prefer to refer to them as the so-called liberation struggles, the, the mantra at the time that was brought, brought by people like Amilka Cabral, and many other nationalist intellectuals was that for the nation to live, the tribe must die. And the problem has always been uh, our failure to, to actually separate these two. What is a tribe and what is ethnicity? And our failure to actually understand this has caused us problems. For example, when we, or when the liberators said for the nation to live, the tribe must die, people failed to ask actually a very important question, whose tribe must actually be killed? And when we talk about Kukura Undi, Kukura Undi was the, actual, was the actualization of this mantra for the nation to live, the tribe must die. And unfortunately, if you read, for example, the works, works by people like uh, Ali Mazrui, particularly in his book, The Blood of Experience, The Failed State and Political Collapse in Africa, or even his 
uh, work uh, where most of the Zimbabweans, or the one that uh, most uh, nationalists in Zimbabwe hated him for, Ali Mazrui, uh, dual Zimbabwe towards averting political schizophrenia. You will realize that he actually highlights some of these things. He talks about some of these things. And the other person that I would have expected we were going to talk about here, Ibo, particularly your former colleague, uh, is uh, Professor Masip Masipula Stoli. His work on uh, the silence of ethnicity in Zimbabwe, he actually made some very important points, actually e emphasizing how ethnicity has become a very big issue because ethnicity is to us as people is actually not primordial necessarily it is by right supposed to be seen as it's a natural resource like we all have all the other natural resources south africa has been able to actually embrace this why has south africa been able to embrace it is because they understood the african national project the way it had been configured and turned it on its head and we in zimbabwe actually failed to embrace this the reason is because we have always seen ethnicity and this so-called tribe thing as a problem when it's not a problem. Having said that, I also want to, uh, I also want to uh, argue alongside uh, what Denizulu Makiplana actually uh, said, particularly when he was talking about uh, the, uh, when he brought in the Franz Fanon's arguments. Franz Fanon actually in his book concerning violence, uh, concerning violence actually says the native's muscles are always tensed. You can't, you can't say that he is terrorized or even apprehensive. He is in fact ready at a moment's notice to exchange the role of quarry to that of hunter. The native is, the native is an oppressed person whose permanent dream is to become the persecutor. This is what actually we see in Zimbabwe when you look at Kukra and the person who actually makes this point very, who drives it home, is actually in Davaning story when he talks about how when they formed in 1963 ZANU, a Zimbabwe African National Union, and then which was a nationalist movement in his, in his view, later on it, uh, it transformed itself to what he refers to as ZATU, Zimbabwe African Tribal Union. This is where we are. This is what we see. This is where Zimbabwe has always been. That is why we see Kukra only the way we see it. I, uh, Dr. Ibo, I want to also emphasize or, or uh, state this point that uh, when I was a young academic best in Zimbabwe at some, uh, some years ago, I had uh, the opportunity of interviewing quite a number of uh, ZANU PF cadres. Key among them were people like Wilfred Manda, Zinachi Machingura, uh, uh, Tekere, uh, Edgar Tekere, and then also Kenan Banana and Hamad Ziripi. One of the things that they made very clear to me was that the salience of ethnicity could not be denied. And that Kukura Undi actually was clearly an ethnic issue. They had only captured the state. And as you would know, Zimbabwe is a successor state. When, when the natives captured the state, the tribal natives captured the state, they used the, respect, the respectable gaps of nationalism. And then in their, in their use of, respect of the respectable gaps of nationalism, they deployed the state assets, that is the army, on civilians, those that actually they labeled as, uh, as, as, as belonging to the other ethne, the Ndebele. And this is why we find ourselves today uh, talking about Kukura Wund. And I must also emphasize, having said that, that I am reminded here, Dr. Ibo, uh, by Chinua Achebe's statement when he says, you, you, you argued earlier on, Dr. Ibo, before I bring Chinua Achebe's argument, you argued that uh, uh, Kukura Undi is supposed to be seen as a national problem. And I have always argued in my writings, and I still argue even, this is the argument I'm going to present here, that Kukura Undi is actually not a national problem. It is actually not a Zimbabwean problem. If it was a Zimbabwean problem, this has taken us more than uh, 25 years to talk about, to, to openly talk about it like this. It is because those that perpetuated it, those that caused it, and that those that, that are still perpetuating it to this day, one, they are in power, two, they have also uh, what we call banal uh, nationalism. They have uh, those that are still supporting it and who are at a moment's notice ready to say, no, but it is not all the Shona who actually perpetuated Kukurawan, who actually committed Kukurawan. Let me make this clear. When we, I am a direct victim of the, of the genocide, when Kukura Undi was actually meted on the Ndebele people, on the one hand, those that actually were foot soldiers, 
the fifth brigade made it very clear that they are doing so, they are murdering our people, they are brutalizing us because we and Debele is an ethnic issue. And on the other end, those that I interviewed, Wilfred Manda, Tekere, and all others, Hamad Ziripi, that I think Dr. Ibo, you know, they made it very clear to me that actually Kukura Hundi was an ethnic issue. It was only managed by ZANU because they had captured the state and they were using state resources, but it was actually an ethnic issue. It was clearly Ndevele being, it was clearly the Ndevele is being murdered, being brutalized, being massacred by actually the Shona. And they argued that they are doing so. And they gave some historical narratives. The point that we should do as, as Zimbabweans, if we really want to be Zimbabweans, is to acknowledge one fact that this Kukraundi thing was done by those that claimed they were doing it on behalf of other people. Those that want to deny it, or those that want to openly challenge it, must actually first openly come out and say, those that claimed to be killing people on our behalf were not doing so on our behalf. We do not support it. This is where we should begin. This is where we should be. If we do not do so, Dr. Ibo Mandaza, we will have a problem because we will continue to claim Kukuraundi as a national problem. Kukuraundi is not a Zimbabwean problem. It is actually okay, resistance and the really problem. You. And thank you. Let thank me you. end it here for now. Yeah, no, thank you. I think what, what we meant is that basically we need to make a distinction between uh, 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 a state, uh, Zanupia State, if you want to call it, using state institution, the army in particular, security, CIO to ravage a part of, of our population and the generality of the population. But I'm also saying that we have that, that we have been done. We need to take responsibility as a nation to deal with that issue, you know? And I agree with you entirely that part of the uh, resolution of the problem is to that those who are, <coughs> who are responsible and many of them are still alive, I have to face the music. We need that. And the reason why the, as Keith says, made reference to the uh, NPRC, that it, it, is, it, is, it is getting nowhere is because many of those who are responsible, directly responsible, as members of the state, security army, are still around. And, 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 and that is, consists of a major problem which we must confront. I'll let, take one more, uh, Wilbert, and then we, I'll ask my panelists to wind up, beginning with uh, Denise Zulu and ending with Tandekile. Wilbert. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. I think it's, it's wonderful to have forums like this where Zimbabweans we can discuss issues of importance to our, to our nation as a, as a people. I think one, the first thing I would like to say here is that I think we should not forget that ZANU-PF is a corrupt, incompetent, and tyrannical regime. ZANU-PF, not uh, uh, generalize it into uh, a particular tribe, ZANU-PF. Yes, it may be predominantly people from a certain region, but nonetheless, people in that party are themselves corrupt, incompetent, and tyrannical. And ZANU-PF is collapsing. I think it would be really tragic if ZANU-PF collapses and we fail to move the country forward. The challenge for us is to move the country forward when Sano PF has collapsed. And we should be very careful that we do not get ourselves really uh, hooked up with what Sano PF did, the agenda that Robert Mugabe, Munangagwa, and the rest of the, of the tyrants set for the nation, and we forget to move the country forward. That would be tragic. One of the sad things about Kukura Wundi is we keep hearing of stories like uh, individuals or uh, groups of people who are failing to get things like death certificates, birth certificates, passports, because 
of events that happened <clears throat> that happened during Bukura Wundi. This is another sign of a regime that is incredibly corrupt and incompetent. What is taking all these years to correct something like that? Surely you could send a team of uh, lawyers or whatever it is into those areas that are affected, get uh, affidavits so that people can say, okay, we do not have proof that somebody was killed, but nonetheless, the evidence we have gathered is sufficient to um, uh, give us confidence to say X was killed. And therefore then we are issuing the death certificate on that basis. And therefore then their family can get on with their lives. What is so difficult about that? I agree with one of the presenter earlier on that some of these things have been festering to the point where they are really becoming a problem. And I think if we get rid of ZANOPF, one of the th first things we should do is go back to some of these problems. Not only Gukura Wundi, I agree, some of the other problems that happened also during 2008, uh, get some of those problems sorted out. And some of them you find they, they will cost the nation nothing. The other problem we have here is, like I said, ZANOPF is incredibly we'll corrupt. We'll end up, we'll end up. Sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll just finish. A corrupt and incompetent is that ZANOPF has destroyed the economy, completely destroyed the economy. And I think the first top priority should be to rebuild Zimbabwe. The country is in a serious mess. There is mass poverty. That is the reality. And if we're going to focus on uh, other things and forget the reality of people who are, who are dying and uh, who are not going to school, the health services completely collapsed, we will be missing the point. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, thank you very much. I now go to our panelists, beginning with uh, uh, forward. But please, let's try and address the, 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 the question, how do we begin to address the problem? And uh, in the context um, of the national question. So, uh, Dini Zulu. Right. Um, I'll try and do it quickly, uh, Prof. Yeah, just two or three minutes. Because we are out of time already. Um, to begin with, I want to talk about the politics of NEMI. We should, uh, in this case, name things that are happening to us and that have happened to us as they are by their names. And then and only then are we going to be able to deal with these problems in their actuality, not in how they have been ritualized or circulated, uh, especially in the state media and all that. Um, we can say we are fighting for human rights in Zimbabwe. We are fighting for democracy in Zimbabwe. We are fighting for development, economic growth, and other monikers. But if we do not get close to the thing itself, which is native colonialism, where some of us black people have colonized the country, the polity and the economy, and are using colonial violence to sustain and keep their dominance, we will not get close to the solution. Because as I said before, going to elections as things are right now in 2023, is a, waste, is a waste of everybody's time. Because the judiciary where we're supposed to appeal when elections are stolen, the army that is supposed to protect everyone if we were a normal nation, the intelligence that was supposed to foster uh, state security, the police that are supposed to protect everyone under that environment are all uh, accessories and facilitators of this native colonialist regime. So why are we wasting time, money, and resources? What we have in front of us is a liberation struggle. That is a higher struggle than just human rights, democracy, peace, and other good sounding things. So I think 
One beginning point, Professor Mandaza, is let's name our condition for what it is, not uh, circulate nicknames, fictions, and some impressions of the thing itself. Without truth telling, without reparations, without institutional changes, without memorializations, and without accountability of uh, perpetrators to victims, the starting point for transitional justice has not even begun. So let's name our problem. After naming our problem, it will be easy to name the solution. And I submit that before us is a liberation strategy, not um, any other smaller structure than that. Thank you so much, colleagues, for this opportunity yeah. and platform. Yeah, bonga. Yeah, bonga for it. Keith. Yeah, bonga, cool. Keith. Keith, yes, with us. Yes. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh yeah, good evening. I'll, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, for me, in terms of ending attrition, particularly around uh, <clears throat> Gukra Hundi, as I mentioned before, we have got a few low hanging fruits that, that us people are interested in the subject matter and the wider national uh, uh, citizens of Zimbabwe can do in terms of uh, moving the issue forward. For example, we don't even have a website, for example, for Google Around it. We don't have a trust for, for Google Around it. We don't have victim names for Google Around it. So for me, those low hanging fruit is something that we can do regardless of the state because we need to data capture all this information because at some point of time, that's when, when we're starting all our process of transitional justice, we've got all this information to which we can work on. At the moment, we, are, we, have, we have nothing in, in terms of, in, even in terms of books, we only probably had two or three Google on the books. You know, we need more books, more education to circulate so we can <clears throat> keep people informed. We only have probably more than four or five Google on the doc documentaries Work needs to be done on that, on that regard as well. We also need to frame white paper legislation that can feed into a new state when it's given birth, whereby we can use such legislation to, to, to move forward our transitional justice process. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Keith. Thank you, Kire, my dear. First of all, thank you, Ibo, for this platform where, um, I believe a very important subject has been discussed. We may not agree about so many things, but I'm encouraged by the fact that this conversation is on the table. So uh, just quickly, I'd like to respond to a few comments. And uh, I think one of the, the comments that has been repeated is that uh, the perpetrator of Kukurahundi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Can you, no, I saw, can you hear you? I saw, okay, thanks. So um, the thing is, we all know that Gukurahundi was a state-sponsored genocide. It was ZANU-PF that did that. We know all the perpetrators. We know from Gabe, Shiri, from, uh, I mean, all of them, we know them by name, Sekeramai, by virtue of the post that they held at the time and because of the propaganda that they spread and the comments that they made. But we need to accept that state violence does not occur in a vacuum. State violence occurs in front of all our eyes and state violence at times is targeted at different groups. So how did the state violence occur? It, it occurred when the state decided to eliminate one of the groups in our country. And if we do not, uh, acknowledge that. It means we are not empathizing with victims, with victims to whom Shona supremacist propaganda was built during the time. If we are to solve this, if, if you are to solve any hate crime, it should come from a position of understanding victims. It should come from a position of empathy. So unless we are ready to really empathize with different victims of the different atrocities perpetrated by the state over the years, we are always going to be fighting amongst ourselves and having these conversations about which victim is worse, which victim is better. If we look at history and other genocides that were perpetrated, if we look at the Holocaust, we talk about the Holocaust every day, but the Nazis did not just kill 6 million Jews. 
They had 5 million other victims from blacks, homosexuals, gypsies, different groups. But we talk. We can hear you now. You are muted. Oh, you have okay. Frozen. I don't. Uh, I, I don't know what's wind going up, wind on. Up, wind up quickly. Yeah, so I was saying it, 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 it's not about which victim is worse, but it's about the gravity of the crimes. We talk about the Holocaust, despite the Nazis having killed 5 million other people, gypsies, blacks, and everyone, not because those victims were unimportant, but because of the gravity of the crimes and because there are some situations that we must never, ever allow again in our future. So anyway, I'm just glad that we had this conversation and uh, I think it's a learning curve for all of us, but like William said, there can never be justice without acknowledging that there was a crime. The, the major forms of justice are restorative justice, where you acknowledge that a crime was committed in the past that created an injustice. So we'll fix it by uh, developing the area where it was done by giving compensation to people, but only if we acknowledge the crime. Distributive justice, which says that marginalized communities will also benefit now that we have acknowledged the crime, needs acknowledgement. All forms of justice, even justice that changes policies, can only happen once we acknowledge that. The okay, Tandikire, you have a problem with your network, huh? Okay. But thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Tendikir. Uh, I'm sorry, there's something wrong with your network there. Uh, okay. Anyway, I think we have come to the end of the evening. Uh, and for me, before I thank the, the, the panel, it's just to highlight the, firstly, the topic, which is the examining the Zimbabwe's national question in the context of examining the root causes of our of the Malays, ethnic ethnicity, ethnic politics, and in particular, the atrocities, in the, the main of which is Bukaraundi, but many others, as Tony Rila has poignantly pointed out, uh, that we need to look at the whole victims, the victims of, of uh, contemporary Zimbabwean history, including those that fell as a result of our own as Africans on Africans. Secondly, we need to look at the national question, which is the main focus. National question as a means, as a basis for building a nationhood. We are saddled with it, the reality. Zimbabwe is there, it's a recognized state uh, internationally. It is a nation state in the making with very dubious credentials up to now but we have to attend to it, especially for future generations. Uh, uh, Tendekila speaks of restorative justice. I think you are speaking to the wrong people. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot speak to people who are at one and the same time, both the perpetrators of, of genocide and expect the same people to, to effect restorative justice. I think we have a problem. And that's why we're saying that we need a reform of the state. We need a new leadership, which sees beyond the present. We need to restore constitutionalism. We need a, 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 a truth and a justice commission. We need to reconfigure Zimbabwe. I think that is what the subject was all about today. We, we, we barely touched the future. I think we got bogged down even to uh, the danger of, of conflating the national question of Gukraundi. I don't think that was deliberate, but I think we almost fell into that trap. We need to go beyond that and, 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 and accept that the resolution of the Gukraundi uh, question is important as part of, of resolving the national question. So I think on that note, I'll want to thank Tendekile, Keith, Selika, and forward to Dinizulu, Jethro, and Pofu for your contributions. This has been recorded. It's on Facebook. It's on YouTube. It's transcribed into a, into a document. 
uh, uh, both for the record, but also for future discussions. We, as I said at the beginning, this is not exhaustive. It was never meant to be exhaustive. We've had over the last two years, uh, several meetings on this issue of Kukurahundi. Kukurahundi is important, very important, also because it is a reminder of the poignant failure of the post-colonial state in Zimbabwe, the failure to resolve the national question. It is, it is, it is a, a blot on our history. It hangs over us, all of us, all of us. As long as, as it is there glaring at us, it's a point of reminder that we have, we have not yet established true nationhood. I thank you and just to remind you the next policy dialogue on the 6th of, on the 13th of uh, May, we are looking at the failure of a regional response to the Cabo, Cabo Delgado crisis in Mozambique with the SADC to be a collaborative event with other CSOs, not only in Zimbabwe, but across the region. Uh, and we'll keep you informed. Thank you, thank you, and thank you again. Goodbye. Panda